Let's talk about electric circuits and their Laplace transform. In our universe, time rules. Time is the king. We describe our reality with mathematical functions of time like f of t, g of t, h of t, or i of t. It took the mathematical genius of Pierre Simon Laplace to open the doors for us into another universe, the Laplace domain, a universe in which time is no more. Instead of that, in that universe, everything is described in terms of frequency, s, the Laplace complex frequency sigma plus j omega. So we present to Laplace our universe, the time domain universe T, and we expect him to provide for us the equivalent view, the transformed view of our universe in the Laplace universe, the S domain. I used to think the first time I read about Laplace transforms that while in our universe we had watches and clocks with two hands, one for hours and the other for minutes, Perhaps in the Laplace universe, the Laplace domain, the S domain universe, clocks and watches had also two hands, one for sigma and one for omega. Of course, that is absurd, but it's a very appealing, intuitive concept. That's why I mention that as an anecdote. We present our universe to Laplace represented by functions of time like f of t, and Laplace will transform that and provide the equivalent one in his universe, uppercase f of s, a function of the complex frequency s. How does he do that? Well, he takes the function of time we give to him, f of t, and multiplies that by a mixed function e to the negative st. Why do I call that mixed? Because it depends on variables on both universes. You see, it depends on t and it depends on s. But rapidly he went ahead and integrated from zero to infinity along the time axis that way, eliminating axis, keeping himself a function of s, the transformed version of the function f of t, f of s. Why do we care going through all that? painful process of transformation from t to s. In a nutshell, because when we differentiate in our world, the corresponding function of s gets just multiplied by s. Neat, right? And when in our universe we integrate a function of time, its corresponding function of s f of s gets merely divided by s. That's very simple. Let's say uppercase f of s is the Laplace transform of f of t. When we differentiate f with respect to time, we multiply its transform by s. When we integrate f of t in time, we divide its transform by s. It is as if he had converted differentiation into a multiplication by s, and also at the same time, integration into a division by s. Combining all of those, we realize that when we provide a whole differential equation to Laplace in our universe, it becomes an algebraic equation in S in the Laplace domain. We will transform the differential equations that describe our circuits into algebraic equations in S in the Laplace domain. Much, much simpler. Well, to solve a system of differential equation, it's going to be our business more often than not. Um, but if we write that system of differential equations, perhaps using the P operator or using VSL, GIDT, and I, CDVDT, and KVL and KCL, in the end, uh, we need to solve that system of differential equations. And to do that, we've been using our mathematics acumen and finding by brute force why is the solution in the time domain y of t. We'll stop doing that because the level of complexity of our circuits has so many differential equations that it's way beyond the range of possible problems a human mind can deal with, even with the help of a computer in nowadays. So what we do is we use Laplace transform and turn that system of differential equations into a system of algebraic equations in the S domain. And then we just use high school algebra to solve that system of algebraic equations in S and find the solutions in the Laplace domain, Y of S. Still not our solutions, but almost there. And from there, we use either inverse Laplace transform or a lookup table or any method available 
to convert those solutions in the Laplace domain y of s into the solutions in the time domain y of t. That is how we're going to be solving differential equations from now on in this course and in many other courses in electrical engineering. Let's apply what we've learned on the inductor. The voltage in the inductor is VL di dt. We know that. If we apply Laplace transform on them, we get, well, di dt is just SI. So VL di dt is V is LSI. If we define now LS as the impedance of the inductor in the Laplace domain, we say the impedance of L is going to be LS, then we can rewrite this expression here as Ohm's law. Check it out. V is Z times I. Z? Yes, Ohm's law all over again. What are the units of that impedance Z? LS. Henry's times... What are the units of S? Well, S comes in radians per second. That is 1 over second. So the units for the impedance up here are Henry's divided by seconds. Fine. But Henry is Weber's per amp. And the Weber is volts times seconds. Seconds cancel seconds, and you get volts over amps, which is ohms. Indeed, uh, the unit of impedances are ohms, at least for the impedance of an inductor, LS. And for the capacitor, let's do that the same for the capacitor. The voltage in the capacitor is 1 over C, integral of its square rent over time. Fine. Apply the Laplace transform to that integral equation. The integral of I is just I over S, right? This term. Uh, but let me move over the S over to this side, and we say the voltage in the capacitor is 1 over Cs that multiplies the current. If we define 1 over Cs as the impedance of the capacitor in the Laplace domain, we can write that expression as V is Z times I. Ohm's law all over again. We have defined the impedance of a capacitor in the Laplace domain as 1 over Cs, and redefined this relationship in the Laplace domain as Ohm's law. What are the units for Z sub C? Well, check this out. The unit for capacitance is farads, right? So this is in reality seconds over farads, but farads is coulombs per volts, and coulombs divided by seconds is amps, and volts over amps, those are ohms. So the units are ohms, 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 ohms. Fine. Now for a resistor, same old, same old. V is RI in the time domain, V is RI in the Laplace domain. Let's put all of them together, the impedances in the Laplace domain. For the inductor, SL. For the capacitor, 1 over C. For the resistor, its own resistance. When we bring back those impedances, we can say that Ohm's law is well and alive in the Laplace domain. V is ZI in ohms. But if we have Ohm's law and we never give away KVL or KCL, of course we can use the same methods of simplification for impedances in series, impedances in parallel, deltas to Y, conversions of Y to deltas, and more. We can use MNA, we can use modified nodal analysis or loop analysis, mesh analysis, which is the same, or um, a cut set method or the branch currents method or any method of your choice. Me, I prefer to use MNA, of course. Hmm, this looks a lot like heavy side. Set of L, LS, set of L, LP, 1 over CS, 1 over CP. What's the deal? No, they are not really the same, because I haven't told you all this story. When I say that for this transformation pair, for that transform pair, when we differentiate in time, we multiply by S in the frequency domain, I was telling you only part of the story. That is true when the initial condition of F of t is zero. But if F of t at t equals zero is not zero, then I have to subtract in the Laplace domain the initial value of F of t at zero. So you say, oh, 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 okay. To differentiate in time, in the Laplace domain, we multiply by S and we subtract the initial value of F of t at t equals zero, the initial value in the time domain. And for integration? Well, this is what I told you before. Integrating time divided by s in the frequency domain, right? Well, that is only part of the story. Because I have to add to that the value of this integral, 
from minus infinity to 0 minus divided by s. This integral is a number, right? Divided by s. Interesting. The meaning of that integral will be clear once we apply that to real electric elements. Let's see. Let's apply this expression to inductors and these other two capacitors. Please keep that in mind. For the inductor, the di dt of the inductor becomes si minus the initial value of the current in the inductor. If we multiply both sides by L, this is what we get, and what we're getting actually is the voltage in the inductor in time and the voltage of the inductor in the Laplace domain. Immediately you say, hey, hey, wait a second. The voltage of the inductor in the S domain is the sum of two terms, two voltages. This one, the voltage drop in the impedance, Ls, and a constant voltage, Lil0, that is opposing the voltage drop. It has the opposite polarity. Graphically, we represent the inductor like that. This is the current in the inductor. This is the total voltage in the inductor from here to there. The voltage drop in the impedance is SL times I, and opposing that, that's why it's facing the other way, we have the voltage LIL0. So we represent the inductor with an impedance SL in series with a voltage source with the value LIL0. Differently from the Heaviside model, the Laplace model includes the initial condition, IL0. Please observe that the inductor is not just SL, not just the impedance. No, it is the combination of both terms. Now for the capacitor. The integral of the current of the capacitor, that you well know that is a charge in the capacitor, is going to be divide the current by S and divide all of that integral from minus infinity to zero minus by S. Hmm, divide the whole thing by C? Sure, like this. Why? So because on the left-hand side, this will become the voltage in the capacitor, right? That means that on the right-hand side, that is the voltage of the capacitor in the Laplace domain. But, 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 who is that integral on the numerator of the right-hand side? From minus infinity to zero of the current in the capacitor. You and I know that the integration of the current in a capacitor gives us the charge in the capacitor, right? So this is the total charge accumulated in the capacitor from minus infinity from the Big Bang down to zero minus right after, sorry, right before we move the switches. So that is the charge of the capacitor at t equals zero minus. Divide that by C. When you divide charge by C in a capacitor, what do you get? The voltage of the capacitor. So that is just the voltage of the capacitor at zero minus divided by S. So let's put that in words. In the Laplace domain, the voltage of the capacitor is the sum of two voltages. The first one is a voltage drop in the impedance 1 over C, and the second one is a voltage that does not depend on IS. It's a voltage source. So we represent the capacitor in the Laplace domain by an impedance 1 over C and a voltage source with the value VC0 divided by S. Check it out. All of that is the capacitor, not only the impedance. The current through the capacitor, I of S, will produce a voltage drop in the impedance, 1 over C times I of S, this term. Plus, that's why it has the same uh, polarity, because it, it's being added to this voltage drop. Vc0 divided by S, and that is a voltage in the capacitor. Again, we say, differently from the Heaviside model, the Laplace model includes the initial condition Vc0. Observe again that the capacitor is not just the impedance 1 over C. No, it includes the initial condition voltage source. It's time for a numerical exercise. Let's analyze a circuit that's been with us for a couple of movies. In that circuit, the switch has been closed for a very long time, and at equal zero it opens. So that means that before t equals 0 was in steady state, and because the source is a DC, it was in DC steady state, and the inductor was behaving as a short circuit, and the capacitor as an open circuit. Our first task will be to find the initial conditions, but the question is, what is it exactly that we want to find in the end? What we want is to find the current in the inductor, 
after the switch opens as a function of time. Let's proceed. Initial conditions take a snapshot of the circuit right before the switch opens. At that time, we have the switches closed. The inductor behaves like a wire. The capacitor, like an open circuit, is DC steady state, and rapidly we compute what is IL naught, that is 12 divided by 4 plus 4, one and a half amps. And uh, because there is no current on this 4 ohm resistor here, and then the voltage VC naught is just the voltage on this other resistor, 4 ohms, which is 1.5 times 6, or the voltage divided is 12 multiplied by 4 divided by 8, 6 volts. Now that we have those two initial conditions, we are ready to move on. And you say, hey, what about DIL DT at zero, mm, at zero plus, or, or DVC DT at zero plus? No. Using Laplace, we do not need those two. We don't. We just use these ones, IL naught and VC naught. Let's remember that after we move the switch, we need to represent the inductor as an impedance in series with a source, right? And the source will have for this current uh, that direction, that polarity. The value of that source is L times IL naught, that is 2 Henry's, multiplied by 1.5 amps, that is 3 volts with that polarity. And the capacitor, the 0 0.1 farads capacitor, will be represented like that, an impedance, 1 over CS, that is 1 over 0 0.1 S, 10 over S, and the voltage source that has the same polarity as the voltage drop in the capacitor, which is VC0, 6 volts divided by S. Let's draw that circuit for T after 0. The left-hand side of the circuit has been erased because it's no more. We are representing the inductor by this impedance in series with this initial condition source with that polarity and the capacitor by this other impedance with this other initial condition source. We want to find what is the current in the inductor IL of S. Let me define this reference down here and say that is an RV branch and say that current is voltage of the origin, zero, minus voltage of the destination, the same reference, zero, plus the values of the source, 6 over S plus 3, divided by the total impedance in that branch, which is 8 plus 2S plus 10 over S. If we simplify that, this is what we get. If we use the Laplace inverse transform, or you look up in the tables, or you do whatever you need to do to find the function of time that corresponds to that IL of S, you find that the current in the inductor as a function of time is 1.5, that multiplies an exponential with a time constant of half a second, that multiplies a sinusoid with a frequency of 1 radians per second and a phase shift of 90 degrees. If we plot it, it looks like this. And I know what you're thinking, wait a minute, how am I going to do that in the exam? Well, you've taken courses in mathematics and, and Laplace transforms and all that. However, you count with an ally in the exam, the HP50G. Let me show you. I begin. Personally, I go to mode CIS, and in there, at the very top, I make sure that the independent variable, I edit that into being X. I will use X instead of S because it's way easier to type. So I change that to X, and I make sure that each one of those radio buttons is cleared. That's my way of doing things. Also, in this other menu, I make sure that the number format is the standard one so that I don't get very long sequences of digits of zeros there. So, standard. And now we're ready. Now we write that expression, right? 6 over s. Of course, I'm using x, right? Plus 3 divided by etc. And I want to simplify that. How? I press the key eval. Boom, eval. Oops, what happened? Well, what happened is that in that calculator previously, I had been plotting curves, right? And when I do that, the calculator creates a variable x where it stores actually the horizontal axis of the curve. You see x there? And right now there is a value stored in it. And when I say eval, what it's really doing is substituting the numerical value of x in that variable into my expression and giving us this number, which is not what I want. 
So before doing the simplification, please purge eggs. And by the way, that EQ variable is where the calculator has stored the formula for the curve that I was plotting before. You, you might as well purge that one too. Well, let's say I purge that and I go and evaluate that and then this is a simplified version of that Laplace expression for the current in the inductor. And then what? And then alpha, alpha, I write ILAP, inverse Laplace transform function, which is an intrinsic function of the calculator. Enter and that is the function of time that is IL of t. Let's see on the far right, 3 over 2, that is 1.5, right? Multiplying by the exponential negative 2x, which is 2t, because the calculator is using x also for t. I type my function using x for s, and the calculator responds using x for t, the independent variable. And that multiplies the cosine of t. You say, what is it again? The one you wrote down here? has 1.5, that's right, has the exponential of negative 2t, that is fine, but it has a sign. I like signs better. So the cosine of t, I prefer to write that as sine of t plus 90 degrees in radians. Sue me. And then you can plot it and live happily ever after. By the way, let me highlight the common mistakes I've noticed among my students. See them there? This is not the voltage in the inductor or in the capacitor. No, it is not. The voltage in the inductor or the capacitor is the whole thing. This is not a representation of the inductor of the capacitor. The whole thing is the representation of the inductor or the capacitor. Do not forget that. Another common mistake is simpler and easier to avoid. It is to forget that when you have a DC source in, this, in the time domain, let's say with a value of k, that will become in the frequency domain, in the Laplace domain, k divided by s. Just a comment, 7 volts in a source is actually 7 multiplied by the heaviside step function u of t. Check this out. This is um, in the time domain, a source of 7 volts in series with a 2 ohm resistor. That will become in the Laplace domain, the same 2 ohm resistor, and the source is 7 divided by s. And here is a very short table of Laplace transforms. But of all of those, we need to memorize only a few. This one, the Laplace transform of the heaviside step, of the unit step, which is 1 over s. And uh, the Laplace transforms of the sinusoid, sines omega naught t and cosine omega naught t. Why? Because of all of the others, we can deduce applying the properties of Laplace that we learned in math courses. What follows is completely optional. If you still have very fresh in your mind what you learned in your Laplace transform courses in mathematics, you may as well skip all of this. But if not, please join me. Let's revisit some symmetry between time and s. When we shift in time a function like this one, you see we are shifting it to the right of the time axis by an amount a seconds. What we're doing to the Laplace transform is decaying that with an exponential that is negative s times a. So shift in the time domain, decay in the frequency domain. The shift in frequency. When we shift in frequency, you see I've shifted the function of s by alpha which is I've shifted that to the left of the sigma axis by that amount alpha, then what I'm doing is, is multiplying the corresponding function of time by a decaying exponential e to the negative alpha t. Or in short, if we have a function of time f of t, and we multiply that by a decaying exponential, what we're doing is just shifting the corresponding Laplace transform function f of s to the left of the sigma axis by that amount, alpha, the coefficient of the exponent of the exponential in the time domain. With that expression, we can go from the first one, the transform of the unit step, u of t, to the transform of u of t, multiplying the exponential e to the negative a t. Of course, all we're doing is just shifting 1 over s, replacing s by s plus a. And that is how we get this formula here. The same applies 
when we multiply sine or cosine by the exponential of e to the negative a t, we just replace s by s plus a. See? No need to memorize all of those formulas. Now more symmetry. We remember that at the very beginning, with no initial conditions, we said when we differentiate in the time domain, we multiply in the frequency domain by s, right? But when we multiply a function of time by t by the unit ramp, its Laplace transform gets differentiated by s. Yes, yeah, sure, with a minor detail that it's also inverted. Do you see the negative sign there? Right, so multiply by t in time, negative differentiate by s in the frequency domain. We go back to the curve, and we notice here e of t that multiplies t. So what we do is we take this uh, 1 over s transform of e of t, differentiate that with respect to s, and you're going to get negative 1 over s squared. And you change the sign, 1 over s squared. That's how you have the transform of the ramp, of the unit ramp. And you don't need to memorize that either. And the same is true for this other expression of u of t, t times the exponential, and the other two are just iterations of those. Let's revisit linearity. The transform of the sum is equal to the sum of the transforms. What? Well, this is what I mean. Let's say we have a function of time f and its transform, uppercase f of s. We have a function of time g and its Laplace transform, uppercase g of s. If we add them in time, their corresponding transform is just the sum of the two transforms in the Laplace domain. That's what I mean by the first linearity property of Laplace transforms. Add the time domain functions, you just have to add the Laplace transforms functions. Second linearity property. The transform of a scaled function of time is the scaled transform. How's that? Check it out. I have that a function of time f of t is transformed into uppercase f of s. If I multiply f by a, a real number, its Laplace transform gets multiplied by the same real number a. That's neat. An example, check it out. Let's say that f of t, our function, is t times u of t. That is a unit wrap. It's 0 before t equals 0, right? And the Laplace transform is 1 over s squared. We've seen that before. And uh, we have another function of time g of t, and that is um, the exponential. e to the negative 3t, that is transformed into 1 divided by s plus 3. Now, if we have that function of time 5t plus 2 times exponential negative 3t times u of t, and we want the Laplace transform, you know what we need to do we need to do is, well, we say the first one is 5 times the transform of t u of t, which is 1 over s squared. Fine, 5 over s squared. And the second one is 2 times the transform of u of t times the exponential, which is uh, 2 times multiplied by 1 over s3. That sum is a transform of this function of time. To close this video, let's revisit two theorems. One the initial value theorem and the other the final value theorem that you may or may not remember. If h of s is the Laplace transform of h of t, then the initial value theorem says to find the initial value of h of t, all you have to do is you multiply your transform function, h of s, by s, and then you let s run crazily big, and the limit, you get the initial value of h in time. Okay, so much for the initial value theorem, IVT. Now, no conditions for this one. But to use the final value theorem, there is a condition. The condition is, if the eigenvalues of the system are on the left-hand side of the complex plane, you say, holy guacamole, what do you mean by that? Well, the real part of the eigenvalue, if it's a negative number, then what I'm about to say is true. The final value theorem. To find the final value of the function of time, you multiply the transformed function h of s by s, and then you find the limit as s gets closer and closer to zero. We better look at an example, don't we? 
tutorial time on IVT and FVT. Let's say we have that um, Laplace function, which is um, the Laplace transform of a current in an inductor. We know which one. We've seen that one, right? So let's find the initial value of the current in the inductor and the final value of the current in that inductor using IVT and FVT. IVT. I multiply that function by S and then find the limit of it as it tends to infinity. You know what's going to happen, don't you? In the numerator, you will get 3s squared plus 6x, and in the numerator, you get the polynomial that you have. When s tends to infinity, the only two terms that actually count are the higher order. But the limit of that is just 3 over 2, 1.5. Next, we check if the eigenvalues are on the left-hand side of the complex plane. That is, if the real part of the eigenvalues is negative. The characteristic equation, of course, is given by the denominator, right? Let's write that in B. Find the eigenvalues, which are negative 2 plus or minus j. It checks the real part of the eigenvalues is negative. So the eigenvalues are on the left-hand side of the complex plane. And we can use the final value theorem to find the initial value. We multiply the function of i, l of s by s, and then we let s get as small, as small as we can imagine. Of course, at the very limit, we have a zero. Let's check. That is the current. So it checks the initial value of that current was 1.5 amps, and the final value is zero amps. And with that, we're done with this video on Laplace transforms and electric circuits. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you all in our next video.